Your um, connection to this deal came through James Gillier, who's an English businessman who you, correct me if I'm wrong, you had met while doing business in various different countries. You talked about doing deals. Then on Christmas Eve 2015, he sent you the following text, which explained the deal with China that he wanted you to become part of. And I just want to read the first sentence of this. There will be a deal between one of the most prominent families from the U.S. and them constructed by me. Yes, that's correct. Tell me what he was saying. So James Gillier was referencing something that he had been working on throughout 2015 with Rob Walker and a Chinese company called CEFC. And he had uh, been traveling around the world developing that deal. And that text was just the culmination of him making me aware that the deal was moving forward. So he, he doesn't say, I want to do a deal with you and me and Hunter Biden, or even you, me, Hunter Biden and Jim Biden. He said, between one of the most prominent families from the United States. He's talking about the Biden family. Yes, that's correct. It was never about Hunter Biden or Jim Biden. It was about the family name, the Biden legacy. At this point, Joe Biden was the sitting vice president of the United States. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I want to fast forward to 2017, early May 2017. And at this point, you've agreed to become part of this deal. Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, the vice president's brother, James Gillier. And they're asking you to meet with the former vice president in Los Angeles. Describe the context. Describe why they wanted you to meet with him. Okay. Uh, across those days in uh, Los Angeles in May of 2017 that you're referencing, I met uh, with Hunter Biden uh, multiple times at the Chateau Marmont and, um, and Rob Walker. And uh, the discussion was they wanted me to sit down with their father just to meet him and uh, at a high level discuss the Biden family and how they approach things. Let me ask you to pause. Will you explain to us who Rob Walker is? Yeah. Uh, Rob Walker uh, was a partner in Rosemont Seneca and had a very close relationship with the Biden family and had developed and been working with James Gillier throughout 2015 and 2016 to develop this deal with the Chinese and CFC. What was his relationship with the Biden family? Um, so my understanding is Rob uh, had worked in prior administrations and had a very, very close relationship. In fact, in Rob Walker's own words, in an email to me, he states that uh, you know everyone was contributing or telling me how they wanted to participate in Sinohawk. And in an email, he basically states in his own words to me, I want to continue acting as a proxy for Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, and the Bidens around the world. The Biden family. The Biden family. So they wanted you to meet with the former vice president in LA. How did yes, that play out? That's correct. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the former vice president was flying in and uh, we were to meet at the Beverly Hilton. Uh, the Milken Conference was going on, obviously one of the top three conferences in the world for anybody that's a global investor or um, developing different humanitarian causes and yeah. a variety of things. And he was, uh, Joe was flying in to speak uh, about the cancer and the moonshot stuff he was working on and Hunter and everyone was in town and they wanted to coordinate me meeting with Joe. And so it was set up for the night of May 2nd at the Beverly Hilton. Um, I met, first met with uh, Hunter Biden and uh, Jim Biden and uh, just had a you know, light discussion where they briefed me that, listen, you know, my dad's on the way and uh, you know, we won't go into too much detail on the business front, but we'll just spend time talking at a high level about you, your background, the Biden family, and then you know, he's got to get some rest because he's speaking as a, uh, at the conference in the morning. So this was at night. The president, vice president has just flown across the country. He's an older man. He's got work to do. Correct. But they carved out a piece of his schedule for you to meet with him. Why, why would they do that? Um, because they were sort of whining and dining me and presenting the strength of the Biden family uh, to get me more engaged and want to take on the CEO role uh, and, you know, um, develop Sinohawk both in the United States and around the world in partnership with uh, CEFC. And uh, I, as you can imagine, I've been asked uh, by 100 people over the last month, you know, why would you be meeting with Joe Biden? And I sort of turned the question around to the people that asked me, why at 1038 
on the night of May 2nd, would Joe Biden take time out of his schedule to sit down with me in a dark bar at the Beverly Hilton, sort of positioned behind a column so people couldn't see us, to have a discussion about his family and my family and uh, business at a very high level uh, where Jim Biden sat and Hunter Biden participated. In. I'm irrelevant in this story. Um, I, they weren't raising money from me. There was no other reason for me to be in that bar meeting Joe Biden than to discuss what I was doing with his family's name uh, in the Chinese CFC. He's, and this is a company with direct connections to the communist government of China. So he, the former vice president has said he had no knowledge whatsoever of his son's business dealings and was not involved in them at all. But this sounds like direct involvement in them. Yeah, that's a blatant lie. When he states that, that is a blatant lie. Obviously, the world's aware that I attended the uh, debate last Thursday. And uh, in that debate, he made a specific statement around questions around this from the president. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I uh, almost stood up and screamed liar and walked out because I was shocked um, that after four days or five days that they prepped for this, that the Biden family is taking that position to the world. Um, and once again, I'm irrelevant in this discussion. I just was brought in to run this company and have uh, been exposed to all of this fact. And I believe the American people should see this fact. I would have much preferred the Biden family go on record and define these facts for the American people on the globe versus me sitting here uh, having a discussion with you on it. So Joe Biden has not denied meeting with you in Los Angeles, correct? Correct. Tell us about the conversation that you had with him. Um, so I initially was sitting, uh, because I got there a little earlier, was sitting with Jim Biden and Hunter Biden, and um, Joe came through the lobby with his security, and Hunter um, basically said, hey, give me a second, I'll go over and give me 10 minutes to brief my dad uh, and read him in on things. And so then Hunter and his father and security came through the bar, and uh, obviously I stood up out of respect to shake his hand, and uh, Hunter introduced me as, uh, this is Tony, Dad, uh, the individual I told you about that's helping us with the business that we're working on and the Chinese. So it was clear to you that Joe Biden's son had told him about this business? Crystal right? clear. Crystal clear. Tell us about the conversation that subsequently occurred between you and Joe Biden. So the conversation, as you're well aware, Tucker, I grew up the son of a career naval officer. So the president of the United States was always the commander in chief, whether they were a Democrat or Republican or other. And so I had the highest respect for Joe and the, uh, you know, the office that he had held. And so I stood up and shook his hand. And uh, obviously we sat down and I think ordered some drinks. I think uh, Jim Biden was hungry and might have ordered some food. And, um, you know, Joe asked me to talk about my background, my family. He thanked me for my service. Um, I'm obviously very proud of that proud of my brother's service and my grandfather's service. And uh, then he walked through sort of his family, um, you know, obviously some of the tragedies they've dealt with, his political career in a high level. Um, you know, we didn't go into de too much detail in business because Hunt, prior uh, to Joe showing up, Hunter and Jim had coached me. Listen, we won't go into too much detail here. This is just a high level discussion and meeting. So it's not like I was drilling down with Joe about cap tables and, and, uh, and, and details. So you said that they wanted you to meet Joe Biden as a way to induce you to participate in this deal. You were, you were the actual business guy here who had management experience, deal experience. But it also sounds like Joe Biden was vetting you to some extent. Yes, of course. Like, um, I didn't request to meet with Joe. They requested that I meet with Joe. And, uh, you know, he's putting his, um, and Hunter says this in writing, it was uh, uh, referenced multiple times, uh, they were putting their entire family legacy on the line. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were dealing with a Chinese-owned, you know, uh, enterprise uh, run by Chairman Yi, CFC, that had strong financial support and political support from the Chinese Communist Party. That's how it was presented to me. That's not my own words. That's how they presented it to me and read me in on it. And uh, my, they, they, they being Gillier and Hunter they Biden. They being Hunter Biden, who was very proud of that and taking credit for it when I sat with him for two hours on the patio of the Chateau Marmont in LA. Proud that they were doing a deal with the Chinese Communist Party? Well, proud that they were that he had the relationship with Chairman Yi, who was running uh, CFC, and the ability for them to get deals done around the world and stuff like that. 
You've seen a number of journalists, reporters covering this story, including some who should know better, declare triumphantly that no document you've released connects the former vice president to this deal. How do you react to that? What's your answer to it? So you can imagine what I've been through over the last uh, couple months and um, knowing all this to be fact and watching Joe Biden and, uh, and his family and their lawyers uh, trout around the world stating that there was no involvement or even at the debate, Joe Biden referenced that you've seen my tax returns and there's no money from foreign you know, enterprises and that. I want to simplify this for the American people as much as I can. On May 13th, that email was sent from James Gillier to me. I didn't generate that email. James Gillier generated that email. And in that email, James Gillier goes through intimate detail of what each individual's requests were from a compensation perspective and how the equity in the enterprise would be divvied up. Very important, May 13th, that email was generated by somebody else to me. In that email, there's a statement where they go through the equity. Jim Biden's referenced as you know 10%, doesn't say Biden, it says Jim. And then it has 10% for the big guy held by H. I 1,000% sit here and know that the big guy is referencing Joe Biden. Um, the, it's, that's crystal clear to me because I lived it. I met with the former vice president in person multiple times, and I had been meeting and talking with Hunter Biden and, and uh, Jim Biden and Rob Walker and James Gillier. Where the media has tried to hide, and I personally feel it's disgusting, is between that May 13th email and the final document that was executed called Oneida Holdings, LLC. In Oneida Holdings, LLC, the equity is broken up 20% Hunter Biden, 20% Jim Biden. Well, they're LLCs that represented them. Right. 20% James Gillier, 20% Rob Walker, and 20% me and my investment entity. What I'd ask the American people to read and look at is how from May 13th to the final Oneida document that got executed, did Jim Biden go from a 10% owner to a 20% owner? That's not my question to answer. I'm sure there were discussions within the Biden family. I wasn't privy to that discussion. But this is Jim Biden, the brother of the potential future president of the United States. It's not a distant cousin. It's not an employee. It's his brother who in documents defines himself as a political advisor to his brother. And so I'll leave that to the American people to answer that. But I don't understand how the American journalist is allowing that gap to be even talked about and defined. So, and, and I should say, and, and I want to put the document on the screen, in his pitch to the Chinese, in his bio, Jim Biden describes himself as an advisor, a current advisor to his brother. So was it clear to you from the beginning that what Jim Biden was bringing to this deal was his relationship with Joe Biden? Yeah, thousand percent, crystal clear. Uh, after I met with Joe Biden the morning of May 3rd at the Milken conference and then was taken backstage um, after Joe had spoken, you know, we joked around for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then I walked him out to his car. I think he was, uh, I think they referenced he was off to see the lieutenant governor. This is Joe Biden. Joe Sorry. Biden, yes. Yeah. And then after that, I went over to the Peninsula Hotel and I sat with Jim Biden for two hours where Jim Biden walked through his history um, and his own words stating all the work and effort he did to get Joe Biden elected initially in Delaware and then through the family history um, and the role that he had played in it. And um, in that meeting, um, remember, I'm the son of a naval officer. I'm a naval officer, was a naval officer myself. And because I held a Q clearance, which is the equivalent of a top secret clearance, um, we're audited every year. So um, if you receive a gift, I think the, the barrier was $25. Anything larger than $25, we had to disclose it to the government because obviously anybody with a clearance, the government is watching closely that they're not influenced by the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese, and stuff like that. So as I was listening to Jim walk through this, um, I have a big heart. If you talk to anybody who knows me, they would, uh, they, they would weigh in on that. Um, I'm a kind person. And um, I'm, I'm thinking about the Biden family, like, how are they doing this? 
I know Joe decided not to run in 2016, but what if he ran in the future? Aren't they taking political risk or headline risk? And I remember looking at Jim Biden and saying, how are you guys getting away with this? Like, aren't you concerned? And he sort of he looked at me and he laughed a little bit and said, uh, plausible deniability. He said that out loud? Uh, yes, he said it directly to me, one-on-one -on -one in a cabana at the Peninsula Hotel after about a you know, hour and a half, two hour meeting with me asking out of concern, how are you guys doing this? Aren't you concerned that you're going to put your brother's, you know, future presidential campaign at risk? Um, you know, the Chinese, the stuff that you guys have been doing already in 2015 and 2016 around the world. And uh, I just can almost picture his face where he sort of chuckles and says, you know, plausible deniability. So he said this is a man who's been drafting off his brother's political career for almost 50 years. He said to your face, essentially, we're, we're lying about it. Uh, uh, anyone uh, watching this interview can look up what plausible deniability means, yeah. and the uh, definition is very distinct. That's remarkable. So I just want to back up a second, just to be clear. You met with Joe Biden twice. Uh, yes, that's correct. What did he say to you after? So he gives his speech to the Millican Conference. And by the way, this is all checkable, yeah. right? I mean, that was a public event. You can Google it. Well, you can go to Milken. They had to issue me. I didn't I wasn't attending Milken. So they had to issue me special credentials. A whole team walked out into the valet, the Beverly Hilton and walked me into that uh, speech that he gave and sat me at the head table uh, in front of everyone. So this is more than checkable. I'm sure there's photos or documentation and stuff. Like yeah, that. the press corps doesn't seem to be rushing to verify. This. Tell me about the conversation that you had with Joe Biden. What, what did he say to you? Uh, you mean the morning after he spoke? That's right. Um, it just it was uh, there was a 10 people running around getting him something to drink and we were backstage in a cramped space and he asked me to walk with him out to the car and he just asked, you know, how I did and uh, what I thought of his speech. And uh, I thought he did a great job in the speech. And obviously, cancer is a very serious thing that we should all be working together to solve. I just lost a sister-in-law within the last two weeks, uh, sadly, to cancer. And, um, uh, and then he just sort of asked me to keep an eye on his son and his brother. Yeah. What, what do you think he meant by that? Um, I think he was conscious of things and, you know, I can't speak for him. Uh, maybe right. I would love for him to go on record. Um, you know, as I referenced earlier, I'm only sitting here because they have not, not only have they not gone on record, they've denied it and they've tarred my family name and a long history of serving this country and have other congressmen now talking about Russian disinformation. This whole uh, smear on Joe Biden uh, comes from the Kremlin. I held a top secret clearance from the NSA and the DOE. I served this country for four years in one of the most elite environments in the world, Naval Nuclear Power Training Command. And to have a congressman out there speaking about Russian disinformation or Joe Biden at a, uh, at a public debate referencing Russian disinformation when he knows he sat face to face with me, that I was traveled around the world with his son and his brother, to say that and associate that with my name is absolutely disgusting to me. Have you, did you complain about that? I mean, to suggest that you were committing treason or a part of a foreign attack on our democracy, which is how they characterized it. I mean, that, that's such a, a serious and, and I think unfair charge. Did yeah. you bring this up with them? Well, in basic form, you're exactly right. They are publicly accusing me of treason right now, um, treating me like I'm insignificant or the uh, 50 years of history that my family served this country is insignificant. And that's why I'm sitting here having this. I assure you, this is the absolute last place I want to be right now and the last thing I want to be doing right now. But I feel like I have a patriotic duty to this country and every American citizen to go on record and to find the facts for them and let them do their own work. Let them decide how they view those facts or not. But for the Biden family to deny these facts and then not only deny them, they could have just said no comment, but they didn't say no comment. They then brought in Russian disinformation and basically associated my name with that, which is absolutely disgusting to me. And I had to go on the record. Last weekend, I was in Virginia. Uh, sadly, my sister-in-law passed away at around, I think, 638 Saturday morning. That's the wife of my brother who spent 28 years serving this country as a naval flight officer and just retired. So you can imagine me dealing with that and the tragedy of that. When I saw Adam Schiff go on record talking about Russian disinformation after this email had been posted online by the New York Post. And remember, that email was to me. 
from James Gillier, right? It wasn't, you know, I wasn't blind carboned or CC'd on that. It was to me stating that I was going to be the CEO of this enterprise. Um, I had, uh, I was at the end of my rope. And so I called Rob Walker and I told him that if that statement isn't retracted by Adam, or, uh, Congressman Schiff by midnight on Sunday, that I was going on record and I was disclosing all the facts to the American government, to the American citizen and the world. I was hoping the Bidens would do the right thing or Schiff would retract his statement, but I could not allow another minute, another hour or day for my family's name to be associated or, or muddied up around Russian disinformation. So even as I sit here today, I would ask the Biden family to come on record and stop using my name or associating it with Russian disinformation. It's absolutely disgusting. So this is Rob Walker, the representative of the Biden family. I believe his wife worked for the Biden family. Um, apparently. So you said this to him. I, I won't go public. I just want them to retract the accusation that I'm an instrument of Russian disinformation. What did he say? That's correct. Um, Rob is under a tremendous amount of stress. Right. Uh, obviously, his uh, wife and a, and, and a child. And he uh, said, L -l listen, let me make some calls. Let me call George, who's Hunter Biden's lawyer, and, and see what I can do. But he sort of presented it as if that's going to be impossible for me to get done. And, um, you know, I'm not naive. I know that's not impossible. To do. That's a single phone call from Joe Biden to Adam Schiff saying, basically, go on record and retract your statement. You got over your skis. And uh, when I, you know, I was up late that night and when the statement wasn't retracted, come Monday morning, I was ready to go on record. And what how that record was, I was willing to go in front of any senator, any congressman, the Department of Justice the FBI, or sit here with you, Tucker, and basically provide the facts to the American people and let them make their decision. This isn't a political focus of mine. People were accusing my family of treason um, after I served this country and defended this country. So the reason you wound up here in this interview, and, and I, I just want to affirm for our audience, I, I don't think you had any desire to do this interview. Absolutely no desire. Is because nobody else told your story. So were you surprised, given the, the trove of documents you have, given the credibility that I, I think is apparent that you have, that no other news organization took the time to unpack this story? Um, surprised is probably uh, an understatement of the year. Shocked, because um, it would be different if this was my word against Jim Biden, Hunter Biden, and Joe Biden. Right. That would be a very slippery slope not something I would take the personal and family risk on it, but I've provided more documents and facts that validate times, meetings, who participated. That email to me on May 13th was generated by somebody else sent to me. It wasn't me generating. These text messages that I've provided are Hunter Biden in the first person, Jim Biden in the first person, James Gillier in the first person, Rob Walker in the first person. It's not me generating the text messages. It's them speaking. So. You can interview them. The FBI can interview them. Our government can interview them. But I was shocked that not only the media is not only discussing this, they're going to the other extreme. They're dismissing it as Russian disinformation. This country has heard enough about Russia. We went through three years of every day, Russia, Russia, Russia. It's just absurd. The Cold War is over. And they're saying it about your family. Yes. The Biden family knew that you're going public with this. And you spoke to Rob Walker about it. Again, the, the self-described Biden family representative and Biden family, the meaning Joe Biden as well. What was his response when you let him know that you were going public with this? Uh, trying to coach me, <laughs> trying to sort of say, hey, we don't want to do that. We don't want, you know, press trucks out in front of our house. I'm going to have to move. Uh, I could lose my job. Um, and uh, all that, um, you know, I'm not trying to cause any harm to anyone in this situation, right. let alone Rob Walker and his family, James Gillier and, uh, and his family. Um, but basically, Rob's position was if you go on record with all these facts, you'll bury all of us. If he doesn't come out on record, I am uh, providing the facts. Tony, you're just going to you. just bury all of us, man. What was your response to that? Um... I was focused on pushing these guys to do the right thing, 
to demonstrate an ounce of integrity in front of the American people. They all know the facts. I live the facts. And luckily for the American people, all the facts are extremely well documented. I'm irrelevant in this discussion, so I can write off, but the American people can read these texts, listen to the recording that you just played, read the legal documents that were executed in Delaware, and they can form their own conclusion. They don't need me to form the conclusion for them. Give us a sense of your contacts with Hunter Biden. I just, a lot of this is complex. There's a lot that we're not, and this is television, so we're not putting, you know, everything that we have on the screen right. because we can't. But for those who might suspect that you don't didn't really have a lot of contact with Hunter Biden, give us a sense of some of the places where you had conversations with him yeah. and over what time frame. So um, obviously, as we already discussed throughout 2015 and 2016, while Joe was still the sitting vice president of the United States, these guys had been doing extensive work around the world in places like Oman, Luxembourg, Romania, that I was being made aware of, but I obviously hadn't come off the bench and agreed to be part of this. I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to interrupt you there. O Oman, Luxembourg, Romania. Correct. So they don't speak any of these languages. Neither one of these guys has any record of success in business. Neither one has a background in international business. Why would they be doing business in Oman, Luxembourg, and Romania? Uh, because, because they have relationships and they have the Biden name that they're able to set up meetings and get people to jump through hoops uh, in an interest to garner favor with the sitting vice president, Joe Biden. So that so it sounds like Gillier is a legitimate business guy, a, di a you know, someone who's who's yes. fluent in the language of yes. international Yes, James business. Gilliard, you know, served his country. He's British. Yes. Uh, he's traveled around the world for decades. He's a very low profile uh, right. individual, but he is uh, he's sharp and he's as legitimate as they come. It sounds it. But Hunter Biden and Jim Biden have a well-documented decades long record of business disasters. Did you get any sense that either one of these guys was qualified to be conducting this kind of business? The only qualification they had was the Biden name. But they seem to have parlayed that into quite a few deals in quite a few countries. And I interrupted you. So, so give me continue with where they were doing these deals. Yeah. So you had asked, you know, uh, the extent of my communication with Hunter Biden. So when I uh, decided to come off the bench and and uh, entertain me in the CEO of Sino Hawk Holdings, um, obviously, I was brought up to speed on the work that they had been doing in Oman, Luxembourg, France, Romania, Kazakhstan, and stuff like that, because that was all going to be integrated into Sinohawk Holdings. Um, and so you asked to the extent that I spent time with Hunter Biden. I personally was in Bucharest, Romania with Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, um, uh, James Gillier, Rob Walker. Uh, I was in Monaco. Um, for the you know, annual Grand Prix there. Uh, I was supposed to sit with Hunter Biden. Um, I met him, uh, I uh, met on the patio of his hotel uh, and I sat there and waited for two hours. Um, and uh, you can imagine how uh, angry and I was frustrated after sitting there for two hours waiting for him without a text, a phone call to let me know I can't make it or I'm tied up. And uh, in a text that I think you guys are aware of and saw, the next day, um, he aggressively comes back at me that uh, he couldn't attend the meeting that he himself set up. I stepped away from family and friends on, on the yacht that I was on with my friends to go sit with him uh, for a couple hours. And uh, he's effectively screaming into the phone that he could not pick up the uh, a phone and text me because he was with the Ukrainians and Mikola, and the founder of Burisma, and that he was fighting for the only income he has on the Kazakhstan deal that apparently he negotiated. Now, I had no exposure to the Kazakhstan deal. I'm not aware of any of the particulars of the Kazakhstan deal. I just know for a fact there is a Kazakhstan deal because Hunter Biden in first person told me there was in the text that I think you guys have and you will show to the American people. Uh, it's not my job to determine what that deal is. I'll leave that up to the FBI or the Senate and the Congress to uh, figure that out. I just want to restate this. You are not a grifter. You're not someone who's selling access. You're a legitimate businessman who's done deals in a lot of different countries. So I just want you to assess once more, is there anything about Hunter Biden's personal experience, personal qualifications that would justify him doing a deal in Kazakhstan? Uh, absolutely nothing. The only thing that he had was the Biden family name and the fact that his father 
at one point obviously was a sitting vice president and potentially would run as a future president. It sounds like a remarkably ambitious international business program they had running. Extensive. His uncle. Extensive. Um, th this is a small point, but I, I, I can't get over it. So you saw a number of reporters say, again, in an effort to bat away your story, your testimony on this, that the chairman referred to in a bunch of these emails was not Joe Biden. It was, in fact, the government of China. When you see people refer to the chairman thinks this, the chairman thinks that, they're talking about China and not Joe Biden. So I want to put up on the screen. Here is a text message you received from Hunter Biden to you. Hey, Tony, I have an idea. In light of the fact that we are in an impasse of sorts and both James's lawyers and my chairman gave an emphatic no, I think we should all meet in Romania on Tuesday next week. And so you're hearing reporters say that chairman was, in fact, the Chinese government. Here you have Rob Walker responding to you. Clearly, there's some confusion over this. And he's saying, and I'm going to put this on the screen now. When he said, when Hunter Biden said his chairman, he was talking about his dad. Correct. There's two chairmen in the story. There's Chairman Yi, who is the chairman of CFC. Yes. In that text from Hunter Biden, he was not talking about the chairman of CFC. And what Hunter's referencing there is he spoke with his father, and his father is giving an emphatic no to the ask that I had, which was putting proper governance in place around Oneida Holdings. So Joe Biden is vetoing your plan for putting stricter governance in the company. I mean, and, and it's, it's right here in the emails. Yeah, yeah, Tucker, I want to be very careful in front of the American people. That is not me writing that. That is not me claiming that. That is Hunter Biden writing on his own phone, typing in that I spoke with my chairman, referencing his father. If the world thinks that that my chairman is not his father, then Hunter Biden would come forward and go on record and state to the world. But you when, have the Biden family representatives, Rob Walker, saying right here, May 19th, no. When he said his chairman, he was talking about his dad. Exactly. Tell me about the money. So in the end, the Chinese did send quite a bit of money. Correct. Where did it go? Um, so... Documents were all executed, uh, even after this back and forth. Um, and the Chinese CFC, uh, Director Zhang, who's uh, number three at the company, worked directly for Chairman Yi. And the way it was presented to me as a very senior Chinese Communist Party member uh, was assuring me that $10 million was being sent to our bank account that was set up at J.P. Morgan Chase to basically fund operations and grow the business. And that of that $10 million... Uh, we were capitalizing the business. So $5 million of that $10 million was being loaned to Oneida Holdings as a non-recourse loan from CFC. And the other $5 million was coming as CFC as their, you know, capitalization of the business because we own 50-50 in the partnership. Um, the Chinese and CFC uh, never viewed me. I'm insignificant and irrelevant in this discussion. To them, it was always the Biden family. It wasn't Hunter Biden. It wasn't Jim Biden. It was the Biden family, who's obviously led and, um, and operated by Joe Biden. And in a document that you guys have, and uh, I think it's been provided to, you know, to the world, the Chinese referenced that because of their trust in uh, the Biden family, that Chairman Yi and Director Zhang are uh, excited about moving forward in this. And in that document, they referenced loaning $5 million dollars to the BD family. Right. The BD family is the Biden family. And notice they didn't say we're loaning that money to Oneida Holdings or we're loaning that money to Tony Bobolinsky or we're loaning that money to James Gillier or Rob Walker. They, once again, not a document generated by me, a document generated by CFC, that they're loaning that money to the Biden family. What are the implications of this going forward? If Joe Biden is elected president, which could very well happen, how does this constrain his ability to deal with China? Are you asking for my personal I opinion? I am. I'm asking for your opinion as someone who's worked with the Chinese. So I think Joe Biden and the Biden family are compromised. Um, obviously, I've referenced that. I held a Q clearance. You're briefed on compromise and you know who you're able to talk with and deal and do business with. And uh, I just don't see, given the history here and the facts, how Joe can't be um, uh, influenced 
in in some manner based on the history that they have where here with CFC and stuff like that. So as a citizen and an American taxpayer, I'm very, very concerned. It seems at this point that there is so much documentation. And again, we have your documents, the ones that you retain, the text, the emails yeah. and the legal documents. But presumably there are many others because there are a lot of other people involved in this. Is it possible that this stuff just disappears and nobody covers it for the next four years if Biden's elected? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of evidence out there. Um, I think the American people should be demanding that this is investigated. And I don't know what the right party to do that is. Is that the DOJ? Is that the FBI? Is that Congress? Is that the Senate? But um, there, there absolutely should be no scenario that this isn't investigated. And as you said, I probably have purview into 10% uh, just picking a round number of what was actually going on. And I would encourage the American people to go online and download, um, you know, Senator Johnson's 87 page report after watching this and read pages 65 through 87 and form your own conclusion. What I've come forward with is a piece in that puzzle that Senator Johnson and Senator Grassley did not have. They didn't have it because I hadn't gone on record and all this information and documentation was kept very, very tight. You asked me if the information disappeared, I would, ass I would expect that uh, other parties have probably destroyed or gotten rid of information. I didn't. I have every email, every text, every WhatsApp that was exchanged and I've provided that to the authorities and uh, here I am discussing it. So you learned from the Senate report that the Chinese sent a great deal of money, but it didn't go where it was supposed to go, correct? Yes, that's correct. So uh, take the American people back to July 2017. I was being told by Director Zhang, who's a senior executive at CFC, that the $10 million was going to be funded in two tranches of $5 million and $5 million. Once again, the way they were approaching that is $5 million was a loan to the Biden family, and $5 million was their contribution to capitalize Sinohawk Holdings. That money didn't come in June, it didn't come in July, and I was in Europe traveling with friends and family and I was frustrated uh, because um, culturally there's a tendency to, hey, it's coming, it's coming, and it wasn't coming. So I was very frustrated, but also in July 2017, something that happened is uh, over July 4th week and while we were celebrating our Independence Day, uh, President Xi was in Moscow uh, meeting uh, Vladimir Putin um, on an official visit. And in that meeting and in that, you know, multiple days, uh, Director Zhang was in Moscow as participating in that. And Rosneft or media in Russia had leaked to the press that they were entertaining selling 14% of Rosneft, which is the state-owned U.S.-sanctioned energy company of Russia, to CEFC. When I saw that leaked, you can imagine, once again, the clearance I held, the military background, I sort of pushed away from the table like, whoa, uh, that's this is stair-stepping things at a level that do I even want to be associated with or do I even want to be near? Shortly after that information got out, I was told that Director Zhang's visa was denied. He could no longer get back into the U.S. for meetings or to, you know, bring his wife and his kids to go to school in New York. And that it was denied multiple times. Jim Biden confirms that in text. James Gillier references it. Kevin uh, Dong Win Win, who's the individual that's referenced in Senator Johnson's Senate report, he went by Kevin. His legal name is Dong a uh, Dong Wen uh, Gong, sorry. And so I was sort of walking on eggshells, you know, what's going on? You're saying this money's gonna be funded, it hasn't come in yet. I'm sort of near the end of my rope here. And um, then in September, uh, easily validated, uh, it's officially announced that CFC is, um, is uh, buying 14% of Rosneft, once again, the uh, state-owned uh, energy company. And so at that point, I just sort of pushed away from the table. The money hadn't been funded into, into Sinohawk, and I was having daily discussions with James Gillier. You know, what's going on here? Um, you know, the Biden name, Russia, China, uh, do, you know, do, I don't want to be anywhere you know, near this. I got to understand all the moving pieces. And so we went into the fall of 2017, very well documented. 
Um, when Patrick Ho, who's an employee or an associate of CFC, landed in New York, he was de detained by the U.S. government and put in jail for corruption, apparently for leaving shoeboxes of cash to two African presidents. And it started this downhill spiral of CFC as a company. Remember, President Xi was traveling around the world under the one belt, one road. That was their political approach. And CFC was the capitalistic side of the Chinese government doing things that they could do on the capitalist side that the government couldn't get done. It's very well documented the work that CFC did in the Middle East, in Czechoslovakia, in Romania, Kazakhstan, uh, in Georgia, all over the world. When they announced that, um, that they were officially tendering for 14% of Rosneft, a deal valued at $9 billion, I sort of pushed away from the table like, okay, obviously that's taking priority over this discussion. Um, and uh, I just sort of, w you know, w was watching things play out once they detained Patrick Ho. I did reach out to Hunter Biden in October 2017, asking him, hey, listen, they haven't funded the $10 million. Have you done something that I'm not aware of? Have you gone around us? Have you started a parallel discussion with Chairman Yi that I should be conscious of? And in a, a variety of text messages that you've been provided, and I think the American people have been provided, he says, no, I didn't go around you, um, but oh, by the way, I'm acting as the personal attorney to Chairman Yi. Now imagine being in my shoes, looking at my phone, reading this text message from Hunter Biden. I just spent six months all out of pocket myself. Nobody was paying me. I was paying for my own travel, my own meals, my own cars, anything that was needed. And Hunter Biden is now telling me that he's meeting personally one-on-one -on -one with Chairman Yi in his $50 million penthouse in New York. And if he can't meet him, he's picking up the phone and calling him, but they only discuss things in person. You can imagine my anger and frustration there because then I'm like, oh, this has gotten slippery. You have gone around me. What's going on here? And oh, by the way, Hunter, you're acting as the personal attorney to Chairman Yi while they're tendering for 14% of the Russian state-owned energy company, a deal valued at $9 billion? What am I missing here? And he sort of just plays it off. And he said, I'm working on a bunch of other personal things and, um, and visas and stuff like that, but doesn't go into a lot of detail. I'd love for you to ask him that. I'd love the American people to ask what those other special things were. You've told your story in a very public way. What do you expect the consequences for you and your family will be? Um, so my focus right now is not the consequences on me. I'm actually trying to be selfless in this discussion. I think the consequences are country faces that average American voter that's thinking about what presidential candidate they picked today or have picked over the prior two weeks or in the future all the way up to the election. I'm doing this for them, not for my family, not for any money. I'm doing this out of a patriotic duty to our country based on my military background and my grandfather's background. So other people can determine the facts and what matters and how they want to vote. But I had to go on record because they chose to sort of mar up my name. So I have a former SEAL team uh, uh, protecting my family. I'm not at home right now. And I'll travel the next four years if I have to. I had to do this. I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Thomas Jefferson. If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance.